Okay, so essentially you want to improvise and to start with, we need something called a blues scale. Let's go for the C blues scale. I've mentioned it in previous videos, but I'm gonna mention it again because it's so important that you get this pattern stuck in your head. Now, the notes go as follows. C, D, E flat, E, G, A, C. You might have noticed we've missed out a few white notes. It doesn't feel like a normal scale that might go something like this. No, this is the blue scale, therefore it sounds like this and it looks like this. So I'd suggest using the fingers one, two, three to start with. Tuck your thumb underneath to get to the E and then two, three and five at the top. One, two, three, one, two, three, five. So if you've got that memorized, we can now move on because improvising is about hitting strong notes and pivoting from those strong notes to other strong notes using weaker notes. That sounds a little bit complicated, but I'm gonna break it up for you. For example, if we've got this chord here in the left hand, this is called a C7 chord or a C dominant seven. And it's made up of the notes C, E, G, and B flat. Now, if we're going to improvise over the top of this, we now know some really interesting facts. We know that the C, the E, the G, and the B flat, anywhere else on the piano is going to work if we want to make something up. So, for example, let's uh, give that a go. I only use notes that my left hand was already playing. Okay, and what you may have already been thinking is, yeah, but you've, you've added rhythms, you've added patterns, you name it. Yes, but it's not all that complicated. Let's simplify even further. Let me play the chord again and minimize the amount of movement that I'm going for and see if I can get just as good effect. I literally just used two notes there. Now I'm just using one note, and I think it still works. Still works. And the reason is, even though I'm just utilizing the one note, I'm making use of rhythm to make that one note interesting. And so you can have this little bit of a balancing act where you can either go for more notes and maybe less rhythm to try and keep it interesting, but easy for you to play, or you can go for less notes and more rhythm in order to make it easy to play again, but keeping it interesting. So when I played all of these notes over the top, the C, the E, the G, the B flat and the C, and did all these little funky patterns, I was essentially just doing that rhythm just with a few extra notes. So this was the rhythm again. Let's add in a second note instead. Maybe three notes. Four notes. and you can see it building up. Now, if you remember that one rule to begin with, and that rule being if your left hand is playing those notes, that means they're safe notes to play in the right hand, then you're gonna go a long way in order to start improvising around lots of chords that your left hand might be playing, because there's nothing stopping you changing those notes when your left hand changes. So we had C, E, G, and B flat. Why not have C, E flat, F, and A for our next chord? and open up more notes to our right hand. Now we've got C, E flat, F and A that the right hand can use. And then when we go back to the C chord afterwards, our right hand can go back to the C, E, G and B flat that the left hand played. Because our right hand is changing as our left hand moves, our improvisation can sound more and more sophisticated. If you stick to a certain set of notes while your left hand is moving around, it's not necessarily gonna sound bad, but it might get a little bit disinteresting. Disinteresting, uninteresting, not sure what the word is, but you get what I mean. You need to make sure there's a little bit of variety for not only your audience's sake, but for your own, because you're not going to practice if you're not liking what you're hearing. And if you're getting bored from what you're hearing, then you are really not going to want to expand any further. So when you're playing and practicing and improvising, take the notes from the left hand chord 
but take the notes from that moment in the left hand chord. If the left hand chord changes, change the right hand. So a little extra tip to add on top of that is probably just to say, our strongest note in a C7 chord is the C. So you may have noticed every time I played a pattern in the right hand, I ended up on the C because it sounds like it resolves. It sounds like it's meant to be there. If I play an F7 chord, yes, it's inverted, which basically means I've shuffled the order around. So instead of F at the bottom, it's in the middle. F is still the strongest note because it's an F7 chord. It sounds like that's where it's meant to finish. And if you think about that a little bit more, it means that your patterns and your ideas are going to resolve appropriately. But you don't want to just stop there. We learned a scale at the start and there's a reason for that. If we take that first idea of only hitting the notes that the left hand is playing, we can then use the scale to fill in any of the gaps that mean our patterns aren't quite as fluid or dynamic as we'd like them to be. So again, let me give you a really simple example. Let's imagine I just wanted to do this in the right hand. I want to go from the C, I want to utilize the E and go back to the C again. Those are two notes that are from the chord. Fantastic, we know they work. But because we've been told or perhaps the book that we've been reading has already said, okay, you're playing the C blues, the C 12 bar blues, we know that the C blues scale can go over the top of it. If we know the C blues scale can go over the top of this and C and E are one of our strong points, all we need to do is remind ourselves of the extra notes that we might be able to add in from the scale. So in this case, we've got C and E, but what if we used C, D, E flat and E? They're all notes from the scale, and we're going from a strong note to a strong note and passing by through very slightly weaker notes. And that one in particular is gonna be very jazzy. So I think the pattern to begin with was like something like this. Something close to that. Now let's add in a few of the notes from the scale as well. Not bad, let's try another one. And there's just something a little bit extra to it. So let's see if we can expand that further. Let's say we want to play between the C and the C here, a full octave. That not only gives us all of the notes that our left hand is playing, of course the C on the top is the same as the C on the bottom essentially, but we can now add in the C, D, E flat, E, G, and the A, and the C, and the B flat, that we had from the chord. You can suddenly see you're getting a lot of notes available to you that shouldn't sound too bad at all. So let's give it a go. Same idea, I'm gonna come back to that C because it sounds like it resolves. Even if it's a higher one, and it's going to work. Each time that I'm playing these, I'm thinking about what note do I want to end up on? You can get away with pretty much any note leading up to that and it's gonna resolve. Suddenly, that C sounded like it was meant to be there and all the other notes, it didn't matter if they sounded like they clashed in the moment, but because I landed on the C and I resolved it, it sounded like it was all intentional. Let's do that again because it is a really weird concept to get your head around. whole thing sounded like a mess, uh, uh, just a, a wrong notes over and over and over again. It sounded like that. And then when I hit the C, your brain switched on and said, oh, that was planned, that was intentional. It's a really weird thing to get your head around. But if you understand that, you can be more adventurous and more creative with how you're making your improvisation runs. So to recap so far, if you've got notes in the left hand, make sure you're playing them in the right. Those are going to be your strongest notes. And then if you know those notes, utilize a scale to get between those notes, the C blues scale in this case, so that your patterns sound more sophisticated or more creative and more adventurous, which is gonna motivate you to keep on practicing even more. Of course, remembering if you change chords in the left hand, say to F, we wanna repeat the same thing in the right. 
only using those stronger notes from the chord, but that doesn't stop us still using that C blues scale that we know the whole piece is made out of, theoretically, if we're playing the C 12 bar blues, and it should all still fit. Let's say the F again. I used a bit of a scale to start with and then a bit of a chord at the end. And I think already with those starting points, you can build up something that sounds really interesting. But I've got a few more ideas that are gonna really help you cement in this idea that improvisation isn't too difficult at all. The first one is that repetition in the right hand is fantastic. You essentially, when you repeat something, you educate the person listening that that is correct. What does that even mean? Okay, so if I do this, and do it again, you're starting to think, oh, that's, that's the pattern that I should be listening for. So if I play that somewhere else, I could change the chord in the left hand and keep repeating. And that means that I can get away with so much for so little. This goes even heavier if you start to use notes that are clashing, that don't even come from the scales that we've learned so far. So let's try this. Sounds a little bit odd, but why don't I play it again? And your brain is starting to learn, oh, that's not odd, that's intentional, that's, that's for style. And then if we start creating some patterns around that, say something like this, and then go back to it, it's like we've had a bit of a conversation. We've gone from one place and then come back to this, this idea that we're comfortable with. We've gone to somewhere new and then we've come back to this idea that we're comfortable with. So let me give you another example just so you can see how that can work again. Let's say the pattern that I'm going to repeat is this. And leave a load of space. Now a bit of improv. You see, I sort of, I gave you a little bit of uh, repetition to begin with, left the repetition, and then came back to it. It's like I'm resolving on myself. Because I keep returning, it's sounding more and more comfortable and it's sounding more and more cohesive as a piece. I think what we've got so far is a really strong basis, but I think there are two more tips that I can throw at you that might just be worth remembering. When you hit any note, you can come off it really quickly. You're like, what was that? What did he just do? I went to the D to the E really fast. D to E, second finger to third. And it added just a little bit more than just playing. That's okay, but what if it was funky? But then I could drag off a black note to a white note and get a similar effect. Nice. Uh, somewhere else. Still works. That was cheeky. I added in a B. That doesn't fit in any of these scales, but you heard it. In fact, if I play that B on its own, it sounds dreadful, but in context, because I hit that C, going back to what we've mentioned earlier, I've resolved the idea. And even if you thought it was clashy, you're like, ah, he meant to do that. Anytime you do these quick movements from one note to another, they're not particularly fancy. They're not too difficult to do. Just drag with one finger onto another note or go from one finger to another really quickly. These are called grace notes, and they're just gonna add a little bit of texture to what you're already playing. Don't do it all the time. It's gonna get really annoying really quickly, but add it as a decorative idea. So the final piece of information I wanna give you is to do with rhythms. You can get away with playing really straight, let's call it basic stuff to begin with. That's okay. 
But if you've got that, see if you can turn it into quavers. And if you can do that, see if you can add swing to it. Slightly different pattern because I forget it every time, but you can hear it building. Now, if you can play notes on every beat, then you can do quavers on every beat and then swing. If you can do that, then make sure that you're not doing it too often. Genuinely, if I keep doing this, there's a point where you're sort of switching off because you're like, okay, it's just going non-stop. There's no, there's no room to breathe. While I was following all of the notes that my left hand was moving to, I was utilizing the blues scale as my right hand was going along, I had no rhythm and I had no timing. When you have no timing and no space to breathe, you're going to bore the audience. You're going to bore yourself and or you're gonna make it really difficult for yourself. So instead of playing runs that last bar after bar after bar after bar because you think, ah, oh, this, this is clearly the way it must work, the more notes I put in, the better the more likely you're going to put off the people who are actually listening. So how do you combat this? You play with the idea that space is just as valuable as the notes for you're putting in. Let me give you an example. Imagine, well, it's no need to imagine. You've just heard all of these notes in a row. Let's hear it with gaps. Suddenly, you're thinking, oh, that was far more pleasant to listen to. That sounded like the individual knew what they were doing a little bit more and could think about their phrasing. If you can step up your improvisation from individual beats to a little bit more regular quavers to a bit of swing on top of that, and then think about spacing and pauses to give every run and movement that you do more meaning, then your playing is gonna sound that much better. And in fact, it's gonna be easier for you to play it as well. And that's probably a really important thing because if it's, if it's not relatively easy to start getting those ideas out, you're gonna get a little bit demotivated. And the most important thing that you can do is stay motivated to keep practicing on a daily uh, occurrence and you're going to improve faster than you could have ever expected. So I hope that all made sense. If you've got any ideas, questions, you name it, pop them in the comments below. If you've got new video ideas, whack them in the comments as well. I'd love to hear them and uh, I'll try and get to them as soon as possible. If you like the video, give it a like. If you wanna see more of this sort of stuff, make sure you're subscribed. And if you wanna make sure you never miss another video, hit that notification bell and I'll see you next time.